It's wonderful to be a tenor <laughs> and to sing those high notes and to have this bell choir accompanying. You have no idea what it sounds like up here. There are bells and, and organ pipes and folks singing. And it just, I just have to say, I'm not prone to ecstasy, but it, uh, at least not in church. But it, um, it just makes me feel like uh, we're, we're in something like heaven. And uh, I, I, uh, it makes me want to clap my hands and just be happy. So I'm going to calm down now and preach a nice, quiet sermon to a bunch of Methodists. <laughs> and in order to do that, I'm going to invite you to pray for me. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are the source of our strength. You are the rock of our redemption. You are the fountain of life and love. Amen. Christ the Lord is risen today. Earth and heaven and chorus say, raise your joys and triumphs high. Sing, ye heavens and earth reply. Love's redeeming work is done. Fought the fight, the battle won. Death in vain forbids him rise. Christ has opened paradise. Alleluia. John's version of the Easter account, the one that's read every year on this day, along with another from one of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, each of them unique and distinct in their own way. John's account is particularly distinctive and unique. John sets the story of Jesus' resurrection in a garden, a setting where so many other scenes in the biblical narrative take place. Deeply reminiscent of the Garden of Eden, where according to the ancient author, everything began, that mythical place where God found everything that is and was and will yet be, the man and the woman too, and then brought them together so that they might meet, so that they might greet, so that they might name and claim one another as helpers, as partners fit for each other. Reminiscent of Eden, the geography of John's gospel where, where he tells us about a garden where Jesus' tomb is located is likewise a fertile garden, a place full of imagination and potential, crackling with power and life. I remember one of my own first attempts at planting a garden. We lived in a parsonage in Belmont in southeastern Ohio. Diane and I lived there. Our children, Sarah and Andrew, were both, both born there during the four years that I served in that appointment following seminary. I was 25 years old when I came. Diane was 24. It, it's a tiny village, the village of Belmont. It's shaped like a coffin, and at the center of the coffin is the United Methodist Church, where 220 or so, before, or fo, or so folks gathered for, uh, for uh, membership and 100 or so for worship each Sunday. It was in the spring of 1983, after we had moved there in the summer of 82, it was that following spring that we planted our first garden a tiny plot out in the backyard by the one-car garage where we parked our one car. It was filled with just a few tomato plants and pepper plants, just enough to keep us busy and to keep the neighbors, Edgar and Mary McLeod, from riding us, from ridiculing us as city slickers unfamiliar with the ways of rural life. They were correct. We were city slickers, but we didn't want anybody to know that. I planted that garden without tilling it properly. I didn't weed it very well. And so there were more weeds than there were tomatoes, much more dust than there were potato uh, peppers. And, uh, and Edgar would come over day after day and just sort of click his tongue at me and at the dust. Tsk, tsk, he'd say. But our garden, meager though it was, also leveraged Edgar's generosity so that, by way of supplementing our weak and tiny fare, he would bring over to us the most beautiful potatoes and tomatoes, peas and beans and ears of corn. He kept us in vegetable all spring and summer. Gardens are places where surprising things happen. And none more amazing, more surprising, more astonishing than that which met the disciples, Peter and the other, the one whom Jesus loved, who ran to the tomb that day after Mary had asked them to do so, urged on by her to investigate the case of the missing body, the two men race away to discover things much more orderly than one might expect 
after arriving on a scene of purported grave robbery. The linen wrappings that had encased the crucified corpse, the cloth that had covered his face and head, all neatly rolled up and stowed as a traveler might clean up a hotel room before leaving for the day. These sights caused one of the disciples, at least, to see and then to believe, to trust that the evidence before them indicated that an activity had taken place which was much more likely to be of divine origin rather than human. But Mary is left behind when the men leave, walking off to do their manly duty. Mary is lost in her grief, her eyes awash with tears, her face red. Even in the midst of her grief, though, she leans over in one kin to the tomb, and rather than seeing what the men have seen, she spies two angels sitting in the same space where the body had lay, one at the head, the other at the feet. Woman, they ask, matter-of-factly, why are you weeping? And her reply comes filled with the anguish and despair that she feels, an anguish which anyone would feel at the gravesite of one who had been so recently lost and so dearly loved. They have taken away my Lord, she cries, and I do not know where they have laid him. How often do our own preconceptions cause us to miss the things that are plainly apparent, the signs of activity, the activities of a creative, recreative God constantly at work in the world's gardens, those that produce vegetables and fruit and flowers, to be sure, but also those gardens that generate freedom, promise of new life, rising up out of the ashes of winter. How often do we refuse to sense to see or hear or touch or taste or smell the extraordinary presence of God in the midst of the ordinary day-to-day -day affairs of our lives, our mundane lives. Mary turns away from the tomb, and she sees a man standing there, his face unrecognizable at first. Perhaps her eyes are clouded by the light of the rising sun over his shoulder. It's just the gardener, Mary assumes, although how wonderful it would be to be just the gardener in the garden of God. It's just the gardener. Woman, he asks, echoing the question of the angel, woman, why are you weeping? But then he asks another question, one that makes all the difference in the world, a question filled with possibility. Whom are you looking for? For whom are you looking this day? For what are you seeking? You who've gathered on this bright and blessed Easter day in this familiar place. Posted a picture of these flowers on Facebook yesterday. And several people responded quickly. I was just trying to set the stage for Easter. And one at least wrote how, how comforted it, it is for her that, that things don't change much up here. That this is what she expects. This is what she hopes for. Are you here to see the same stuff? To sing the same song? Christ the Lord is risen today. Golly, we sang that last year. You're here to see the same voices, the same story, hear the same stories. Or are you here, as I am here, to see something new? A new possibility, a new face, a new voice, a new name, new hope rising up out of the ashes of our old ways of life. Mary begins to worry again about the fate of the missing body. And she asks the gardener if he has any idea where it has gone so that she might go and recover it and then have something to hold on to in the midst of the shifting sands of, of faith and time that are underneath her. But then Jesus does the most amazing thing. He calls her by name. Mary. And with her response, Rabuni, which means teacher, she reveals... That she has become more than just a friend, more than just a griever. She is now a disciple, one who walks in the footsteps of this rabbi, a follower of the Christ. I have seen the Lord, she gasps, when she returns to the others to tell them the glorious good news. She is the first one ever to see 
and then to say. And so it's in the same way that Jesus calls us this day. Calls us by our own names, in fact. Tim. Stephen. Nancy. Diane. Charlie. Don't worry, I'm not going to call all of you by name. <laughs> Jesus calls us by our own name so that I and you might become one of his disciples, so that we might walk with him along the way, the way that leads to life, and might join those others who have walked and who are walking and who will yet walk that way with him, with us. So Paul writes in the third chapter of that letter to the Col Colossians, these persons who several decades after the event that we celebrate today itself uh, happened, several decades later still walk that road. So if you have been raised with Christ, and the sense of the Greek grammar here is that it ought better be translated uh, since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the throne of God. Set your mind on the things that are above and not on earthly things, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Lives again our glorious King. Where of death is now thy sin? Once he died, our souls to save. Where's thy victory, boasting grave? Soar we now where Christ is led, following our exalted head. Made like him, like him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. King of glory, soul of bliss. Hallelujah. You know that line. Everlasting life is this. Hallelujah. Thee to know thy power to prove. Hallelujah. Thus to sing and thus to love. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen. As we prepare now to pray together, please allow me to name before you those persons for whom we have particular concern this day. We pray today for Myra Sinclair at the Doylestown Care Center and for Sandy Musselman and Rick Stahl, both, both at uh, Westview Manor. Remember Verna Olenschlager, who's a member of our choir, but is home following a hospitalization this past week. We ask for prayers for Tom Smales and his family on the occasion of the death of Tom's wife, Libby Smales, on April 9th. And for Pete Reynolds and his family on the occasion of the death of Pete's wife, Anita Reynolds, on Friday, April 14th. In the latter case, a service of death and resurrection will be held here in our sanctuary this Wednesday at 10.30. Calling hours on the uh, Reynolds family will be also here in the, in the sanctuary of Worcester Church Tuesday evening from 4 until 8, Tuesday the 18th of April. We're praying for Doris Snoddy today. She is our Worcester United Methodist Church Person of the Week, and her address is in your worship folders for your remembrances. And then finally, we lift before God our Habitat family, the family of Mindy Jackson. This spring and summer, we'll be joining several other area congregations in building a Habitat house. In fact, I was told late this week that we've raised our designated amount, but we were over $5,000, which is our, our financial share of the Habitat project. So there will soon be information about how you and I might start hammer, or, uh, volunteering at least to hammer nails and. Uh, and paint walls as we prepare that house along with the Jacksons for their residency. The Easter flowers in front of me and behind have been provided by persons whose names are listed in the worship folder insert and in honor, in memory, or in celebration of many loved ones. If you are one who has purchased one of these, we ask following the service today that you come and take the one that uh, is yours. There are no names, so just take the best one and uh, take it home with you. And, and, and uh, They're beautiful, but 
get the smell out of here. It's uh, driving us crazy. No, no. So let's go to God in a moment of silence as we prepare to pray.